Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, I recognize that uh, many of you are still sampling the dessert bar, uh, but I want to start our afternoon program uh, so that we can stay on time uh, for the final panel, which will be starting at 2.15. The Honorable Stuart Baker is currently a distinguished visiting fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, but will shortly return to the practice of law at Steptoe and Johnson in Washington, D.C., where he has been a partner for many, many years when he's not in government service. Stewart received his undergraduate degree from Brown University and his law degree from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. And then following graduation, he clerked for Judge Frank Coffin on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and he also clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. From 1979 until 1981, Mr. Baker helped start the Education Department and served as Deputy General Counsel of that department. He then went into private practice with, as I said, Stepto and Johnson. In 1992, he went back into the executive branch in government service and served for two years as General Counsel of the National Security Agency. We've discussed that, and it's been in the news of late. After that, Stewart served as General Counsel of the WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, investigating intelligence failures prior to the first Persian Gulf War, 1990 and 1991. He then went back into private practice until 2005, when he was called yet again into government service this time as the first Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security, where he served until earlier this year. Now, I, on a personal note, uh, I, I've got to tell you that I've, I've had the privilege and pleasure of knowing Stuart Baker for a number of years, uh, incident to uh, the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security. And prior to becoming uh, the Assistant Secretary for Policy, uh, Stuart was the chair of that commission. Uh, and, and I hold him uh, in, in high esteem. Uh, I have been trying to get Stuart down here uh, to, to address our conferences for a number of years, uh, and I was totally unsuccessful while he was in Washington, and it's like he was locked in a cell and Mike Chertoff held the key. Uh, he was so busy. Uh, but to tell you how much I appreciate it, Stuart flew in on an airplane this morning, uh, landed around 9.30, He'll speak here, and then I'm going to whisk him and the ambassador and his wife to the airport. Uh, so he will be with us for about three hours. And to come all the way from Washington, D.C. to speak to us on this occasion uh, really, I think, says a lot about his dedication to national security, uh, our attempt here to inform the debate. So Stuart, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the conference. Uh, I, I really appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, I have to say my career is an increasingly futile effort to make sure that my remarks are shorter than my bio. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna work at that today as well. Uh, but uh, I could not resist the uh, opportunity when I finally uh, uh, broke free uh, of uh, uh, the uh, 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 cell that Michael Chertoff had me in uh, uh, to come here uh, uh, because uh, Scott Zellman is really one of the premier uh, uh, thinkers uh, and writers about national security law, uh, and it's really a delight to be here. Um, the topic that uh, Scott asked me to address was uh, what is the Obama administration's uh, homeland security <coughs> agenda? And I, I thought of uh, uh, a fellow who, who worked on a commission with me, the WMD commission, uh, uh, and uh, he looked around and there were a whole bunch of uh, old hands uh, and he said, yep, typical commission, they brought back all the guys who used to have the job to tell them to fix the things these guys couldn't fix when they were in government. Uh, and so I think that's my job today. Uh, I intend to uh, explain what it is that the Obama administration ought to do that we didn't do. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, uh, two or three things. Uh, uh, I want to talk about the border uh, because uh, if there's one thing that the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security has become successful at, it's developing a genuinely integrated approach to the border, something that 
uh, I think quite remarkably, did not exist before DHS was created. And if there is a question about what is DHS good for, did it make sense to create the department, uh, if I were trying to persuade someone that it does, I would point to our border management. Uh, prior to the creation of DHS, border responsibilities were spread among three different uh, departments. Uh, uh, the uh, Transportation Department had the Coast Guard, uh, Customs had the uh, uh, Customs uh, uh, Inspectors, uh, the uh, Justice Department had Immigration and Naturalization Services. Uh, not one of those departments thought that worrying about the border was a principal part of their responsibilities. Uh, now with DHS, uh, uh, the ability to focus on a coordinated but, uh, border uh, strategy has really created some opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, second thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, cyber attacks and cybersecurity. Uh, uh, it's going to be a major challenge for the next administration. And then if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, big attacks, things that would shock us if they were to occur in the same way that 9-11 shocked us when it occurred, uh, something that would, would uh, cause mass destruction uh, and, and what needs to be done to prepare for that possibility. So uh, we've had a very long and very successful run of preventing acts of terrorism in the United States, and that has been uh, very gratifying for those of us who joined up in the hopes of, of achieving exactly that. Uh, uh, and if, if I had to say what do I think of the things that made us mo uh, successful in preventing those attacks, one is that uh, sanctuaries became much more difficult to maintain abroad for people who were planning attacks on a large scale. Uh, that's something that, uh, that ab ability to deny a sanctuary to uh, 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 people who are planning attacks is going to become more difficult over time, not less. Uh, uh, it is one thing to say we're going to invade Afghanistan, though we did not do that prior to the attacks. Uh, um, and uh, uh, it's one thing to invade uh, Afghanistan. It's a very different thing to uh, uh, try to deal with a sanctuary that's inside a nuclear power. Uh, and the nuclear power neither can uh, deal effectively with the sanctuary itself and certainly isn't going to let other people come in and try to deal with it uh, either. Uh, and so the, uh, the prospect that we will see continuing sanctuaries or the emergence of new sanctuaries in places like Somalia uh, where young kids from Minneapolis have been recruited to learn uh, uh, terrorist and military tactics. Uh, uh, these, are, these are great worries and things that would require an extraordinary amount of discipline, activism, and a willingness to take a certain amount of abuse in the international community for the administration to address, and it's not clear that that's going to be the strategy that they want to uh, approach. So uh, sanctuaries will, if anything, under either administration would have remained and uh, uh, they may grow. Uh, which means that I think the other uh, tool that has stood us in good stead will get a more of a workout and, and that is, in my view, our border security measures. Uh, um, it's not an accident, I believe, that the two most clearly uh, Al-Qaeda planned attacks on the United States that we've managed to thwart uh, but the ones that were most clearly uh, derived from inspiration in the center um, were aimed at committing an attack on the United States without ever actually encountering our border security measures. That is to say, in each case, Al-Qaeda's plan was to blow up American-bound planes before they landed uh, in the United States. This was uh, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, uh, and then the uh, liquids plot uh, in London, uh, in, in the UK uh, in 2006. Uh, I believe that, that the reason that they did that is they believed that they would have trouble getting enough people through our border uh, to carry out an attack, and they'd rather not take that chance. Uh, and what we have done at the border in an effort to uh, uh, make it difficult to come in, and I recognize I, I was here for the panel where uh, a, a lot of criticism was aimed at what we do at the border, uh, and I understand the concern about that. Uh, uh, at the same time, I, I think it, it's important that we recognize it's our last chance to stop people uh, uh, who are coming here to uh, do us harm. It's a big challenge. Uh, 
we have gotten travel back up to the point where it was in 2007. International travel has actually surpassed, set a record uh, uh, coming to the United States this year. Uh, and that means we have hundreds of millions of people coming across our border every year that we have to, uh, and we have to find 20 people that uh, might be planning an attack and pull them out and subject them to enough uh, scrutiny so that we actually uh, keep them out of the country. The way we have done that, and this is, this is what I mean about uh, thinking about the border in a coherent way, we actually came up with, and I, I should give some credit here to Nathan Sales, who is now gracing academia uh, as one of the great uh, national security scholars of his generation, but he gave us a lot of the thinking that, that went into this. Uh, uh, I call it the three who's. Uh, first, we need to know who's coming. We need to know it in advance. Uh, if you have all of your security measures up on the front line and you have 30 seconds to decide whether this is somebody that you should give more scrutiny to or not, um, governments are not good at making decisions in 30 seconds or less. Uh, uh, and, uh, but if you give them time to run it up the chain and to, and to get back a, a validation that says, yeah, that's right, we meant it, uh, uh, you are much more likely to get uh, decisions, even if it's only a matter of hours, that makes sense in the context. Uh, so we need to know people are coming in advance. This is not something we knew. Half the, uh, the overseas travelers who came to the United States came on the visa waiver program. They just showed up and, at Dulles Airport, and we had 30 seconds to decide whether they were coming there or not. Uh, and uh, that's not a long-term solution. We have now put in place a, uh, an online system where you can, you can determine whether there's any problem with your coming if you're in a visa waiver country. Uh, you fill out the form, we say, yeah, come on down, we don't have a problem. Uh, or we may say, you don't actually qualify for the visa waiver program, you need to go to the uh, embassy and get a visa. This saves a lot of people who otherwise would have a pretty bad experience at our border because they aren't eligible for VWP, but they don't know it, uh, a lot of hassles. But it also gives us insight into who wants to come. It's been working very well in terms of people being compliant, filling out the forms. Uh, one last step that the administration is going to have to take, we have to make sure that uh, people like Richard Reed, who we don't want to have come and who we have told they can't come, don't just get on the plane anyway. Uh, and right now the airlines have not developed systems that allow them to talk uh, in a uh, two-directional way with the uh, U.S. government to know here are the people we're putting on the plane, or do they have the authorization to travel? And, and as soon as they do that, uh, we will have made it much more difficult for Al Qaeda to pull off the sorts of attacks that they seem to have uh, been particularly fond of in the last several years. There, there will be, once that's done, there will only be one place where people show up and have to be cleared in 30 seconds, and that's the Canadian border. That's a very tough nut to crack. Uh, but we certainly have pl had plenty of efforts to come across that border uh, in the past, both by Al Qaeda and by others, uh, and we are not uh, always able to get the people on the front line to make the right decision. Uh, there was a, uh, a lawyer who had uh, uh, multi-drug uh, resistant TB who we caught, he left, he left from Atlanta uh, on his honeymoon uh, and we told him, we the government of the United States, told him he had this and that he couldn't travel and that we were putting him on the no-fly list when he was in Italy. Uh, and he did what, you know, uh, anybody would do in, the, in those circumstances. He said, well, I'm on the American no-fly list. I'm going to Canada. So I'll just go to Canada, fly into Canada, and drive across the border. Uh, and uh, we had put out a, an alert for him saying, you know, this guy is dangerous, put on a mask, put on the gloves, uh, uh, put him into quarantine immediately. Um, but he showed up. The poor guy at the border had 30 <coughs> seconds. He actually he took the, the, the passport. The notice comes up. He looks at the guy who is apparently blooming in health, just married. His wife is with him, uh, and he says, he doesn't look sick to me. Ah, go ahead. Uh, and on, uh, that's the kind of mistake you get if you don't have time to actually verify that really th th this is what's meant. Uh, one of the questions that the Obama administration will have to face is what are we going to do about trying to make sure that we have a little bit more warning about people coming across the Canadian border? Tough, tough decision. 
second problem, uh, second, second stage of this is once you know who's coming, you need to know who you don't want to come because uh, 99.99 percent of the travelers are people we want to uh, welcome. Uh, and to do a good job of welcoming the people who should be welcomed and scrutinizing the people who should be scrutinized, you need to know who you're worried about. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, ways you can get that information. You can get that information uh, from uh, your own uh, terrorist screening center, database, et cetera, the CIA and others contribute to that. They know something about who, do, who they're worried about uh, in Romania and Syria and uh, uh, France. But frankly, the Romanians and the Syrians and the French know more about uh, the people in their territory. Uh, and what we have needed and, and have been seeking diplomatically is more information from local governments about the people that we should look at hard when they come to the United States. Um, for example, who do you think uh, is a, a suspected terrorist or a known terrorist in your territory? Uh, it, a lot of countries have people that they're quite confident are fundraising for, uh, for terrorist organizations or actually actively involved in operational matters for them. They don't always surprisingly tell us in a, uh, a way that we can use at the border. Uh, and uh, uh, the State Department has spent years trying to get uh, uh, cooperation from uh, uh, some of our best allies uh, on that topic and not always gotten it. Uh, we at DHS took a, a new approach to that and basically said to all of the countries that wanted visa-free travel to the United States, from South Korea to the Czech Republic to Estonia, we are glad to do that if we have the ability to really screen travelers. We're going to put in place the ESTA, the, uh, um, the electronic screening, and then we would like you to tell us who you believe to be terrorists in your country. and. Uh, give us access to the ability to check the criminal records of people who are coming across the border. Uh, remarkably, we kind of assume that uh, you know, when, when a state trooper stops us in the United States that he can find out whether we were arrested uh, anywhere in the United States or Canada. Um, that uh, ability does not exist at our border. People show up, uh, you know, we, we get people not, unfortunately, as uh, uh, rarely as we'd like. You get a 30-year-old man and a 10-year-old boy uh, who is carrying just a, uh, a birth certificate to show uh, who he is. Uh, and the guy says, yeah, that's my nephew. We have no idea whether the guy who's bringing this kid in has been arrested or convicted of being a pedophile in his home country, in most of the countries that uh, send visa waiver travelers to the United States. So again, if we had better information on who is a, uh, a risky traveler, then we would be much better able to focus our attention uh, on screening out the people we really should worry about. That's something, again, that uh, uh, the Bush administration started. We now have uh, known and suspected terrorist information sharing with uh, uh, more than 10 countries. We have uh, uh, criminal data exchanges with around the same number of countries. Uh, uh, there's going to be a big challenge trying to persuade the people who are already in the visa waiver program that they ought to uh, agree to share this information, that they ought to take the risk of saying to, the, the, to their constituents, yes, we do share information with the Americans. I think this is an opportunity, frankly, for the Obama administration because it's a lot easier to say you're sharing information with the Obama administration than to say you're sharing information with the Bush administration, and I hope they'll use that. Uh, uh, their uh, new reputation to uh, uh, seek genuine cooperation and concrete cooperation on anti-terrorism measures that would help us at the border. Uh, last thing that you need, of course, is you need a system to make sure people can't change their identity to, 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 to avoid your whole system. And uh, that's something that we have worked on for years, trying to improve the quality of passports around the country. Uh, around the world, uh, and uh, uh, I have to say I think we've done a pretty good job of improving the passport security of um, uh, other countries, uh, and based on recent uh, GAO reports, we actually probably need to do some work on our own passport security where we discovered that people were walking in and using the names of folks who died in 1965 to get uh, passports, and the 
uh, State Department uh, investigators weren't able to catch that. Uh, State Department has taken some action to uh, address that, uh, and uh, I think uh, a really careful scrub of how we issue uh, passports is probably overdue. Uh, other things that I think will happen on the border are, are less uh, 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 likely to be contentious. Uh, the Bush administration famously built a lot of fence, uh, hired a lot of, almost doubled the size of the border patrol. Uh, I don't think that the, uh, that trajectory is likely to change substantially under the Obama administration, and uh, I don't think there needs to be substantial increases in the resources that have been devoted to either of those tasks, uh, in part because we're getting a little bit of a break on uh, uh, illegal immigration by virtue of the economy. Uh, the numbers have declined by something like 40% uh, due to a combination of economic for, uh, uh, forces and uh, tougher enforcement at the border. Uh, and so the likelihood that we'll have uh, bands of people coming across and running down our freeways as, as used to occur uh, uh, in San Diego is, is really, uh, it has been eliminated and isn't likely to come back. Uh, uh, that's going to create some breathing space for the administration and it's also given them a chance to uh, focus on the crisis in Mexico, which is going to be uh, a major issue for the uh, Obama administration. They have, uh, I think, very uh, credibly stepped up to the plate uh, on that. This is something that uh, has been a concern of both administrations, but the uh, Obama administration has taken it to heart uh, in a uh, particularly persuasive way, uh, including um, for the first time beginning to raise the question, how much scrutiny should we give to people when they leave the United States? Uh, certainly there are people buying weapons in the United States and driving them south. Uh, the United States has not traditionally looked, spent much time worrying about people who are leaving the country uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Mexicans have not always been as good as they should be at looking at people who are entering the country. Uh, we need to find a new way to cooperate with them to make sure they're more effective in preventing people from bringing uh, guns <coughs> and uh, illegal drug proceeds across the border south. Second issue that I wanted to talk about uh, uh, is the um, risk of cyber attacks. This is also something that is getting a lot of press, uh, and you might think it's a recent development. In fact, I think there's been a steady increase in the sophistication uh, and the ambition of the uh, uh, compromises of U.S. Cyber, cyber infrastructure over the last 15 <coughs> years. It was a worry when I was at NSA in the 90s, in the early 1990s, but it was more of a theoretical worry, uh, and the people who were doing it were mostly, uh, um, it was the cyber equivalent of counting coup. You would, you would, you would uh, uh, try to uh, uh, compromise somebody's network who was thought to have a pretty secure network, and then you would brag about it to, to show what a good programmer you were. And that was pretty much the only consequence of having a hacker succeed against you. But it, it became first a uh, area where you could make a lot of money. If you could compromise a lot of machines, they could all send spam for you. Or they could all launch denial of service attacks on a gambling site uh, I guess I shouldn't mention the fi final four, should I? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, on, on, you, uh, you, should, you could pick a holiday when there's a large sporting event uh, and take out a gambling site uh, uh, with a denial of service attack. Uh, and again, extort funds uh, from the gambling site to get back up online. And that has meant resources have been available to uh, uh, develop attacks that did not previously exist. and. Uh, uh, organized crime has uh, uh, become enormously successful with uh, cyber attacks. That, of course, is not the national security concern. The national security concern is that whether in league with uh, organized crime, imitating organized crime and going beyond it, uh, um, uh, nation states have begun to see opportunities in compromising large information networks. Uh, uh, if you are able to compromise a uh, major network, uh, especially a communications network uh, or a government network in the United States, you really have two opportunities. 
you can uh, sit on that network and steal information for as long as it seems valuable to you and get a lot of uh, very useful information right from inside the, uh, the United States. And then when you're tired of that or when the, uh, the calculus changes, you can take the system down. Um, and so uh, uh, you, you capitalize on the dependence of the U.S. on these networks while uh, in peacetime and then you can uh, uh, attack them uh, in a time of crisis uh, and again capitalize on the dependence of the United States on those networks. That's the nightmare uh, and I have to say that uh, as the sophistication of these attacks has grown, uh, uh, the confidence of uh, government actors and uh, uh, commercial actors, even financial institutions that know there are people trying to steal money from them every second of every day, their confidence that they know how to stop that has diminished steadily uh, uh, over the last 10 years to the point where I think we have finally reached a, a state in uh, our debate where the private sector no longer has confidence that it can do this alone and the government is, has become very concerned that uh, uh, there is no obvious way to protect any of the networks that uh, uh, we depend on. Uh, that means we're going to have to take pretty dramatic action to try to uh, shore up our defenses because we face the prospect. I, mean, I, I, I know that there are a variety of nations that are mentioned in this context and they all are people who sound like uh, uh, former Cold War adversaries and the like uh, and there's an assumption that somehow this is like uh, uh, be, being part of a nuclear club and that only nuclear club members are going to uh, uh, use these capabilities. That's false. I, uh, Moore's law is at work on behalf of the hackers, just as it's at work on behalf of uh, uh, the rest of us who depend on this technology. And uh, uh, things that can only be done by sophisticated nations uh, today will be done by unsophisticated nations tomorrow. Uh, and so we face the prospect that uh, almost any military intervention that we might feel necessary to deter uh, 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 raw aggression across a border right, uh, in the future uh, could result in consequences uh, in the United States. That uh, uh, we intervene to stop someone from uh, attacking a neighbor and the next thing we know uh, the electric grid is out in New England in the middle of the winter. Uh, that will change our willingness to intervene uh, and you might say, well, okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, but uh, if, if we don't intervene in some of these things, then the um, price of, inter of, of attack grows ever smaller and we may not like the world that we uh, find ourselves in. But we also won't like the world we find ourselves in if we are routinely attacked by uh, nations that we don't think have a particularly strong military but who nonetheless have the ability to cause harm on the home front. Uh, uh, that's the national security concern about these um, uh, interventions in our systems. Uh, the difficulty, as I see it, is that the cure for this is not at all obvious. Uh, our administration began it. This is genuinely a problem that uh, uh, we did not fix, uh, a, a where I am suggesting that uh, uh, it will fall to the next administration to address uh, more seriously. The Bush administration began on this topic uh, and uh, uh, began over a considerable amount of resistance that I think has, has gradually waned as people saw the seriousness of the problem. Uh, but the proposals to address this issue that have uh, gotten the most attention, uh, that are getting uh, reviewed by the government today, are mostly focused on shoring up U.S. government uh, networks to make sure that the civilian agencies have this as good a uh, uh, security protection as the military networks have. Uh, one, that's not necessarily good enough. Two, I'm not confident that it will be much comfort to the American people if we have a crisis and we're attacked in a way that takes down networks that uh, if people who can't get power and can't get telephone service and can't get to their ATMs are told on broadcast TV, don't worry though, the agriculture <coughs> network is still working. Uh, it, it, the, we, we've got to find a way to protect our uh, civilian infrastructure in private sector hands. That's going to be a major challenge, uh, something again that has been worked on to a degree in bits and pieces uh, in the United States. But uh, uh, 
uh, it will be up to the Obama administration, I believe, to come up with a coherent strategy for working with a pretty skittish private sector uh, on that kind of uh, defense. And last, uh, uh, let me just say um, one of the less pleasant parts of uh, uh, working at DHS is that you had to contemplate the worst case scenarios. Uh, you had to, had to do what we had not done before 9-11 and, and exercise a certain amount of imagination and ask what is possible and how would we respond to the worst uh, attack that is possible. Uh, uh, and uh, it's pretty obvious that there are two attacks uh, that are possible that would uh, be as shocking today as 9-11 was uh, when it occurred. Uh, uh, and and I'll, I'll make this first observation. You might have thought uh, that somebody was worrying about this sort of attack before DHS was created. Uh, and the answer is that really wasn't happening. Uh, a terrorist attack uh, using weapons of mass destruction was always something that would get a nod, that would get a, uh, a certain amount of lip service prior to uh, the creation of DHS. But there was no one who felt, well, this, it's my job to make sure it doesn't happen and to think about how we can prevent it and how we can respond to it. Uh, uh, and, and that lack of sense of bureaucratic accountability uh, it meant that planning for those sorts of events was less uh, intense than it probably uh, should have been. DHS knows that they're going to be held responsible for planning for and responding to that, and that has led us, that led DHS in the last administration to spend some time thinking about a nuclear attack or a biological attack that could, could kill tens of thousands or 100,000 uh, Americans. Um, I would say that this is another topic which, on which it's rather disappointing how much progress we have made in planning for those events. And I'll just give you a couple of uh, uh, scenarios. One, um, we finally began the process of asking, suppose there were a terrorist attack in New York uh, with a nuclear weapon, goes off in Times Square. Um, what should the uh, first responders do? Uh, and we created a hypothetical uh, fire department uh, company in uh, uh, Queens, just across the river, looking at uh, uh, the uh, attack. Uh, and the question that was asked was, OK, what, what should that fire department do? They can see there's been a nuclear blast. There's still a mushroom cloud rising over Times Square. Um, and after consulting with all of the experts, the consensus advice is, they should go to the basement and wait 12 hours. Because if they, if they do what they're likely to do, which is to get in the uh, uh, hook and ladder and drive as fast as possible until they find somebody who's injured or something that's on fire and try to uh, rescue those people, then they'll be dead too soon because the, uh, uh, the fallout is so uh, dangerous. But that fallout uh, uh, dissipates quite rapidly and becomes far less uh, uh, you know, one one thousandth of the toxicity within 12 hours. Well, that, uh, that turns out that advice has never been given to any of the fire departments that we're of, uh, we're aware of, and a lot of them don't have basements. Uh, and uh, so, uh, one of the things that we need to do is begin realistic. That the next administration needs to do is do realistic plans and then integrate that with the uh, uh, local response for emergencies, so people have some idea what they should do. Same thing with biological attack. Again, uh, everyone had talked about it, thought about it. They hadn't said, how are we actually going to respond to it? I happen to think that an anthrax attack is one of the more likely attacks uh, for a variety of reasons we don't need to get into. Uh, what's interesting about a, an anthrax attack is that if you take uh, 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 countermeasures, uh, could be something as simple as penicillin, uh, within uh, uh, a couple of days of the uh, uh, exposure, uh, you'll almost certainly live through the experience. And if you wait five days, you almost certainly won't. Uh, it's as near a thing as that. Uh, and yet, um, a, an anthrax attack doesn't have to announce itself. 
you know, you don't have to put on the outside of the envelope, this is anthrax, take penicillin. Uh, and I don't think they will. Uh, and consequently, right now, in many cities, the first time we'll know that there's a problem is when people start to show up sick, uh, which is very late. We need to deploy, as we have in many cities, but not all, uh, more air measures that will simply allow us to know that there's been an exposure. Even if we do that, the likelihood is it'll take us about two days to know that we've been exposed, and we have about another day, maybe two, to get uh, penicillin in the hands of all of the people who need to get it. Um, our current plan, I have to, I'm embarrassed to say, calls for the post office to deliver it to you all. I, and, and I think also maybe we're going to try to find somebody who can ride shotgun who has a gun. I, the alternative, which is being tested over considerable medical resistance, is for people to actually like go out and get penicillin, keep it at home, uh, and then when, when they get a notice saying take penicillin, they don't have to wait for the postman, they can just start taking penicillin. Uh, there is remarkable resistance to this idea because the, a lot of people in the medical profession, especially the public health pr profession, really are uncomfortable with relying on the responsibility of individual uh, potential patients to uh, keep that uh, uh, penicillin and not take it for a, uh, a cold or a virus or something where it's inappropriate. Uh, um, we've done tests. Uh, I think we did one test in Missouri. The only person, we gave them a specially marked package, said don't open unless it's an emergency. Uh, uh, no one opened that package uh, except one woman, uh, about 80, who heard a um, tornado alert and decided that she'd better open her package. Uh, again, uh, actual planning for this issue is going to depend on the next administration. It's begun, but uh, it will not be easy because uh, there are genuinely, uh, there are very sincere opponents to handing out that kind of countermeasure to Americans. So I can see that the hook is being prepared. Uh, I will uh, stop now. Uh, Scott, do, do we have time for questions? Uh, I think we might have time for one question. And I apologize because I didn't start us early enough, but we have a plane to meet. So one quick question, if there is one. And please speak up. Helen, and why don't you use this? Cause it's OK. Is that so I can start walking? <laughs> Uh, they, they have looked at both uh, groups. I think there's probably a, you know, an analysis of uh, animal rights uh, uh, attacks somewhere. I, I, I think that, the, that, that that's a totally overblown uh, uh, fuss. I think both the Huffington Post in, in saying, oh my god, there are right-wing extremists getting ready to attack us, are wrong. Bel Air Country Club is safe. Uh, and uh, and I think that the, uh, the Drudge and, and all and you know Michelle Malvin uh, Malkin uh, uh, are also wrong to say oh they, they hate us this is a smear job by the new administration. Uh, I, I I saw reports like this all the time. They are written. I, I think the way to read it is to look at it and say somebody was asked to say what's the worst thing. What's everything we know about the risks of right-wing extremism? Put it down, every, every fact that you can find. Uh, and then we'll all decide how seriously to take it. Uh, it's not the job of the writer of that report to decide that this is a problem. Uh, if you read it with that point of view, uh, there's not a lot to worry about. Uh, of course, they have to cover their uh, uh, bases. Um, but uh, I would. Uh, I, I would suggest that what is happening, unfortunately, uh, is that we're in the middle of a giant pivot in which all the sides uh, change sides. And so soon we will see the left <coughs> defending uh, anti-terrorism measures against claims by the right that this is a violation of civil liberties. Uh, and the, the, the right is talking itself into that, I think in, inappropriately, by indulging in paranoia about what is a boring and uh, only kind of marginally
competent piece of work done by uh, competent career bureaucrats. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take liberty. Please join me in thanking Stuart Bill. Again, uh, the last panel of our conference will start at 2.15 uh, back there, and uh, we hope you will stay for that last conference.